Hello, I'm Erica of Knit Kind, and I'm going to record a short video today about spinning. Now, I'm by no means a spinning expert or even someone who's been spinning for a long time. I'm coming at this from the perspective of a knitter who wanted to learn more about wool and spinning and the whole idea of farm to needles to sweater, um, much like people who really enjoy food and consider themselves foodies like to understand the process of farm to table. I can see that there's a little bit of glare in my glasses, so I'm gonna to try to keep them on, um, but if I can see it getting bad, I might take them off. This, again, is a very impromptu video. It's not planned. Um, it is something that I've been thinking about in my mind, and this week, at least three people who are knitting related friends and acquaintances have reached out about different spinning questions, and I thought I would just try to record something conversational as if they were sitting across the table from me and said in 15 minutes, you know, what can you tell me to get started without telling me so much that I'm paralyzed. So that's where I'm coming from today. Quickly so that I don't forget, I'm wearing the rock pooling shawl, which was a release by Helen Stewart when she does the seasons. I think there are like 13 or 15 patterns at once. Um, and this was from a few years ago, maybe 2018 or 19. But again, if you look on my Ravelry, Nitty Elf 40, you'll see all the details. It's knit in Manos del Uruguay. Uh, it's a DK weight shawl. It is, I believe, a silk merino blend that I used for the colors that to me are meant to look like beach and water and the water going through the sand and rocks. And down here, this is a company that is no longer uh, active. I don't believe they had closed at least for a while. They were based um, in Savannah, Georgia, I think, Unwind Yarns, and I picked this skein up on a trip to Hilton Head. This was specifically dyed for Needlepoint Junction, which is a local yarn shop in Hilton Head Island. I'm also wearing a shawl cuff. I highly encourage you to upcycle old belts, belts you find at thrift stores, um, make beautiful complimentary shawl cuffs with a little snap on there and hold your shawl in place. So where do I start? Well, I'm gonna show you a few different things. One is how did I start spinning? Drop spindle. Um, so many people recommended starting on this and personally, I think start where it works for you, but there is something about going back to basics and knowing where things come from so you know where they go and you figure out where you wanna be in that uh, spectrum. This is a Louette hand, uh, drop spindle. It is a top whirl, so again, I'm not the expert. I know the basics, and I'm gonna come at you from a knitting perspective of someone who wants to dip their toe into spinning. There are uh, also bottom whirls, and I believe there are some that you can use both ways. So what happens with this is you'll get raw wool. Um, you know, you're gonna get wool that looks like this, you can buy that in a combed top. You can buy it in a bat. There are many different forms, but usually for starting, getting something like a combed commercial top is going to be your, your easiest start. It doesn't mean it's the only way. It doesn't mean it's the right way. Um, what that means is that the wool has all been combed in the same direction. And I'll, I'll touch very briefly on, on a few things there, um, but that and staple length are the two things that are gonna set you up for probably what you'll feel like is more success, whether or not it actually is at the beginning. Um, so you can see how the fibers here are just very smooth um, as opposed to even getting, I'll show you really quickly, a braid, which you can open up and smooth out, um, but sometimes just getting a bag of fiber that's a little bit more loosely packed can be helpful. So the other thing I mentioned is staple length. So let me really quickly show you. You have your wool, you start to pull, and where does it naturally separate? You're gonna hold something like this out, okay? And you'll see if you do it, no matter how many times you do it, you're gonna keep getting that same natural length of the fibers, and that is your staple length. I think that what's recommended as the easiest place to start is somewhere in like a three to five inch staple length. 
But again, that's information you can get if you look up very specific tutorials about spinning, which this isn't today. This is just to give you a real quick idea. So based on the type of wool that you use, and you can see I'm itching my nose now because it's touched my nose. It's not scratchy, but it is um, tickly, if you will. So depending on the breed that you use or the blend that you use, um, fibers can have silk blended into them. They can have a combination of alpaca and wool. They can have different wools, obviously. There are so many sheep breeds. So depending on what you have, you'll have a different staple length, either a long wool, maybe a five to seven inch staple length, or a very short one of one to two inches. I would say don't start there. <laughs> um, and to give you a little tip to write down, if you're completely new to this idea and you wanna look up tutorials, I highly recommend looking up park and draft methods. That is gonna be, um, if you're starting with a drop spindle, where you wanna start. So you'll attach your yarn, you'll spin, you'll park, you'll draft. And you're gonna do that over and over again and you will eventually get yarn, I promise. Um, so this is the one I started on. It was clunky, I thought I'm never gonna be able to do this, but I did persevere and I'm gonna show you a little bit of what came out of um, my first spin that had any remote success to it. Uh, and that's this yarn. You can see it's thick and thin, I mean, it's thick and thin. And then there are parts that maybe look a little bit more like yarn. <laughs> um, mind you, this is after it has been plied and washed and finished. So this, this big old hunk here that looks like you could have taken it straight out of a um, bag of fiber to stuff a stuffed animal <laughs> was the first thing that I somewhat got into a yarn. And then I later plied it with the color. Um, and I, the white, I'm not sure. It, it was, I believe, a, just a nondescript wool that came with the drop spindle, which I got at the fiber loft in Harvard, Massachusetts during the Greater Boston Yarn Crawl a few years ago. Um, and it came in just a little package to try. So uh, that was what eventually was number one. And please know that I didn't even have hope it would be anything like this. But the fact that I had a piece of fiber that you could pull and didn't come apart was success to me. Um, so what are a couple of resources when you first start? I'm going to show you two things, again, from the knitter's perspective. One is the Knitter's Book of Yarn, and this is by Clara Parks. And for anyone who's interested in learning more about wool in general, look up Clara Parks. If you don't know her, if you've heard of her and you haven't looked yet, look. Um, there is an audio book or a, a book if I do audio books a lot because I can do them while knitting or spinning or other things. A book called Vanishing Fleece if you want to go really deep and I'll probably talk about that in the future. But this, The Knitter's Book of Yarn, is just a really good resource with a lens on fiber. And a great complement to that is yarn texture. I think I'm saying that right, yarn texture, um, by Jillian Moreno. And those two really complement each other nicely, I think, if you're coming from a knitter's perspective or crocheters. I, you know, please know anytime I say knitter's perspective, um, that's the lens I'm coming at it from. I am going to learn to crochet and we'll have more on that later too, but, um, you know, a fiber artist. So this, again, is something, if you are reading it and you want to start spinning and you're getting too deep, put it down. The only things I want you to think about if you want to dip your toe in spinning at first are the type of fiber, the type of tools you're using, your staple length, and if you're using a drop spindle, spindle try park and draft first. Those are my key advice um, points. And otherwise, have fun. Don't worry about making mistakes. And just jump in because what's the worst thing that can happen? You have a pile of wool in your lap and you'll figure it out later, right? And drop spindles, by the way, um, you can get them, I think, for as, as low as $10. Now, it is like tools, and to some extent, you do get what you pay for. So here's how my story goes. This has a lot of uses, and I will still use it to ply, and in fact, I can still use it to spin. <clears throat> it was not gonna set me up for success in the long run, for me, personally, spinning. So at the winter 
farmer's market that I've mentioned before in Wayland, Massachusetts. There are two farm fiber days. And what I picked up next was this little guy. And I wish I had uh, the card with me right now, but it is a Bosworth spindle. And the reason I wish I had the card is it's like buying a little, it's like buying a car with your sticker in the window. It tells you what type of wood for um, the whorl and the shaft. It tells you the exact weight in ounces. And I thought, what does this even mean? And the people that own that are so sweet. They will say, go ahead and try it. Test, you know, it's like taking a test drive for a car. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna be so embarrassed because this is what I can do right here. So if I try to spin in front of um, these folks who are walking around spinning and, you know, literally the drop spindle where they're walking around talking to you, they're spinning as they go and everything's great, I'm gonna be horrified, right? But again, what do I really have to lose? So we tried it and I am not a car enthusiast, so this is probably a terrible example, but it was like minivan, Corvette, Porsche, Ferrari, you name it, right? And I thought, okay, now I see where this is going. So $10, maybe 65, something like that, I can't remember. And this is um, not quite entry level. They do have some a little bit less and they have some a lot more. It depends on, you know, you can get exotic wood. You can get all kinds of bells and whistles. Um, and then also you'll notice one difference here that I wanna point out. This, smooth all the way around. This one, see this little notch right here? Uh, and sometimes I believe they might even have more than one notch, but that holds your yarn, right? So you can see the difference in size when I hold these up and in weight and that changes things. It also changes how easily or not you can make a thicker or thinner yarn. Um, and when I say yarn in the case of this, you're talking one ply. So we've talked a little bit of, about plies uh, and we will talk a lot more about plies, but in the meantime, understand when you're first spinning, you're spinning a single. You can keep it and use that single, just like in knitting, right? Um, or you can make a yarn that is two ply, three ply, four ply, and so on. A lot of time in hand spinning, I think in my experience, you're gonna see a lot of two ply and some three ply. Um, all for down the road, but just understand that. And with the two ply, of course, that's giving you something that the two piece, the two singles uh, pull together in a certain way. So a lot of people recommend two ply for lace specifically, because when you block it and pull it, it the two pieces pull against each other and they'll open up your lace. A lot of people recommend three ply for things like cables, because you want those to be pulling in on each other. Wetting your appetite there. Also not an expert there, but know enough to be dangerous, okay? Um, so, that was attempt number one. I picked up some different breeds. I picked up some colors. I picked up some natural yarn and I just kept going. And so one of the things I'll show you here, if you're thinking of jumping in, well, how do I do this and do it in a cost effective way and know what to get? And a lot of places will have things like this. And this is a sampler. So you have small amounts of different types of yarn. And I think something like this maybe cost me $14, um, just a little bag, and it will tell you the details on the back. So this is from another uh, vendor who was at that same show. They're called Friends in Fiber. They are on Etsy, friendsinfiber.etsy.com. And they will tell you what is the breed you're getting? Where is it from? What is the, fi um, what is the description, okay? The micron count, which is the softness. So the lower, let me hope I'm saying this right, the lower the micron count, the softer it is. And in these books that I mentioned too, you'll see something like the micron count of human hair versus a cashmere, angora bunny, um, merino sheep, you know, all the different breeds. And where does that fall? And keep in mind that there are disadvantages to having things that are very soft with a low micron count too. One is they, they may pill more, okay? So it's really about understanding it all, not just getting the softest, not just getting the certain staple length. It's really like starting to learn like you would 
with anything else that you want to become have more expertise in I won't necessarily become an expert in but have more expertise in and make more informed decisions it's about learning those things so you'll see here it's going to show you a staple length it shows it in millimeters um, a micron count and some other uh, characteristics so like for example on the brown finish it says rich natural brown with orange tones similar to BFL, which is blue face Lester. It gives you a micron count of 28 to 30, a staple length of 80 uh, millimeters, and it says great felting wool. And when I hear great felting wool, it's also something in my mind where I say, not necessarily bad for touching your skin, but maybe not the softest thing that's going to touch your skin, right? But if you want to make a pair of, you know, felted, um, mittens with a, a softer inside and a felted outside, for example. Um, so anyway, the, the, this is just a few, and there are many. I just wanted to show that as an example. Okay, um, so where did I go from here? Well, over my shoulder, this machine right here <laughs> is an electric eel wheel five. And that I purchased actually from a test knitter who worked on a test knit for me, and we got to chatting, and she asked if she could do the test knit in something that uh, she had spun herself versus the recommended yarn. And I said, absolutely, I would love that because I would, one, I wanna learn more about this myself. And two, I think that's a great way to show examples to other people. So as we got to chatting and she was telling me about her tools and I said, oh, I really wanna get um, an e-spinner but I'm not sure about investing or I wanna get a wheel, but that's a huge investment without being able to try it out. And although I have looked into local guilds and there certainly are some, um, it's not as accessible to me as needle arts, right? I have a lot more resources, a lot closer about knitting, somewhat about crochet, um, even things like embroidery, but spinning, not so much. So uh, I will mention for anyone in Massachusetts or, or somewhat nearby, there was a local yarn shop called Iron Horse. It was in Natick, Massachusetts. Tragically, many years ago, they had a fire and they really lost everything, but they are still in a barn in Sherbourne, Massachusetts. And uh, recently they have opened up some more hours and Debbie there, um, I think does still teach spinning. You have to call and make an appointment with her though, or if appointments are available online. Um, I think that she is still a local resource and there is a guild. Um, so I don't want to say that there's no resources. It's just something I haven't been able to tap into quite enough that matches with my schedule and my geography yet. So in other places, there are tons of, of spinning guilds and resources, and I think there's nothing like in person. Um, I will say, especially for something like spinning, where you are really engaging on the tactile elements of what you're working with and how you're working. And um, to me, that's a little bit harder to do online, but it's certainly not impossible and it is how I learned. So I'm not a master spinner, but I'm gonna show you some of the yarn I made after all that. Okay, so some of still working on the breed specific uh, drop spindle experiments. This is so dark, I don't think you can really even see it, but this is from that breed sampler. And it is, uh, Wooly wool in a way that I probably would de describe it as a little bit scratchy. Um, it doesn't smell anymore now that I've finished it, but it, it kind of stunk, I'm gonna be honest. It, it smelled like wool. And uh, I do hear some folks coming home in my house, so I may stop and start recording again. This, um, I won't have to show you everyone, but I'm just gonna show you quickly what some of these looked like. These are all two ply and you can see I was getting a little bit better like this piece here. That looks like yarn, right? I can't, I don't know if I can get it to focus <laughs> a little bit more so. Um, they're thick and thin, but that's okay with me. I am an artist and I love art yarn. So I got into some of the dyed merino and this is actually very soft. I do really like that look of, like I said, not only an art yarn, but a hand spun. Um, so this is a two-ply with merino wool in colors and a natural color. And just show these close up. 
And then somewhere in here, I think these next two were also done on the drop spindle. And you know, I just, um, I just made the most of it and I had fun with it. So you'll learn in those books a bit about when it's overplied or uh, overplied, overspun, when it's underspun. Um, you can still use those yarns. You don't have to throw them away. You can hang them up and have them look pretty or you can knit them um, or crochet them, right? So these are what some of my earliest and this is the last one I did on the drop spindle entirely. And so I felt like the end, by the end, you know, I really felt like I was making progress for the type of yarn. I mean, you can see here, there's some inconsistency for sure, but there's much more consistency than there was earlier. Um, but it took forever, right? So this, for me, as I really did not get past the park and draft on the drop spindle. It wasn't super natural to me. So I did say, and I wanna to touch on this really quickly before I show you the things I did on the e-spinner and then we'll wrap it up. Um, the difference between woolen spun and worsted spun, I wanna mention. And um, again, I'm gonna give you a real short, not a deep expertise on this, but I'm gonna give you a real short explanation. When you're spinning worsted spun, it's a smooth yarn. So if you think of commercial yarns, let's say um, Malabrigo Rios is fairly, or you know what, any big box yarn that you're gonna get that has that smooth feeling, even an acrylic, right? It, it's all spun. It is worsted spun. If it is woolen spun, you're talking more like a Green Mountain spinnery. The fibers coming into the spin are either that combed top smooth, or they're coming in kind of jumbled with more air in them. And that's the woolen spun. So um, a lot of people talk about combination spinning and I think some people feel there is and, and some people feel there maybe isn't, but you'll see, you'll see the more you learn about it. It's not something you have to think about much or dwell on much, just know smoother is more woolen spun, uh, worsted spun and, and airier and kind of more jumbled and what we think of as that like crunchy wool is the wool and spun. Lots of W's and lots of things that have meaning across multiple things, right? We have worsted weight yarn and worsted spun yarn. Um, so for me, most of what I have done is either worsted spun or some kind of combination, which might be completely incidental, but just because of how I'm doing it. Um, you'll also see right here, that's a blending board. I'll show you that down the road. I um, think it's super cool. You can make roll logs with it. And it's a, it's a really neat way to blend colors and do all kinds of um, more intentional spinning, starting with fibers that are less prepared in some cases or blending scraps together. And it's really neat. Um, so I showed you the electric eel wheel five. What I didn't say is that is from a company also based in Massachusetts, I found out and didn't know at first, called um, Dreaming Robots. And Maurice Ribble founded that as a way to try to make spinning more accessible on an e-spinner. Um, the e-spinners can be very expensive, just like wheels. And someday I will probably try both of them. But in the meantime, being able to buy something that's at a price point um, that works quite well, I really appreciate as a, a enthusiastic hobbyist, if you will, for this right now. And this little purple number right here, which I know you can't see well, I'll show them close up in the future, but this is just a, a shorter chat today. That is an electric eel wheel that is called a Nano. And that's the original one. And for anybody who saw the Black Sheep Knitting podcast um, that just came out this weekend, you'll see that the owner of that shop is going to try one too. I had my son, who's seven, spinning on that. He was dying to. Um, we picked them up at a fiber festival from someone who supported the Kickstarter and had some of them left and wanted to just move them along. Um, so we got them at a very accessible price point, I will say. We were fortunate. Um, again, that one I bought from a test knitter. That one I bought him last weekend. 
So what did I do on the E spinner? I'm gonna show you that quickly. I have one, uh, you know what, actually, this one might've been my last one. It's in a little hank from the, the drop spindle. Okay, so E spinner. So um, I got some beautiful fiber from Alice Field, and I have to give a little woot woo to that because my grandmother was named Alice Field, which she knows, and she probably, I've probably told her the story twice now, so I won't tell her again, but I'm telling you. Um, she owns, I think it's Fox Hill Farm, and I'm pretty sure I have that right. She has won multiple awards out at Rhinebeck for um, the quality of her yarn, and I think it is mostly corn. Is it Cormo that I bought from her? I'm going to, I think it's mostly Cormo that I bought from her. That's not what I was going to talk about today. So let me fast forward. But um, some of that is in here. And I also have some on my, let me hop back here really fast and I will show you. Um, this is definitely from her. I'm going to make a three ply out of this. And I'm going to do that just in the natural color. Oh, you know what? Here it is. Here it is. Saves the day. Uh, it is Cormo 100% wool. It's a top. And it's Fox Hill Farm in Lee, Massachusetts. So um, I like to blend the natural colors with some color as well. This is blended... It's a little hard to get the color, but this is a really nice fall palette that was from a braid. And um, that was Border Lester. The colored one is Border Lester from a farm in Lakeville, Massachusetts. And um, that farm shows at the Wayland Show as well as on Martha's Vineyard in the summer. So if you're on Martha's Vineyard and you go to the Ag Hall, um, they... I'm trying to think about that if it's at the farmer's market or the artisan's fair um but anyway look for them i think it's windy hill farm i hope i'm getting that right i'll share all of this more as we go this is this is a quick talk that's turning into a half an hour isn't it um but you can see i made what i felt really proud of here even if you can't see the colors great you can see that this is almost more like if i can get it to do it just right right this is not my forte here so let this not be a dress rehearsal for ever working in a yarn shop. Um, but I can actually make what looks a bit like a skein of yarn that you might buy, right? Um, we all know those ones. Some of them started as hand dyers, um, hand spinners, and became commercial, and others have been commercial from the start, um, but small business. So I'll just do a... a mention of a few. I feel like a lot of people know spin cycle, so I am um, I will mention them and you know they're out on the west coast, but then out here on the east coast we have fiber junction mill, which I, junction fiber mill, oh my gosh you guys I'm so sorry, junction fiber mill, I got that right, in White River Junction. Um, they are doing one at their mill from a combed top I think and they do worsted spun uh, and it's similar, right? So if you have hand spun and you want to do it yourself, amazing. If you want to buy something that is just as beautiful from a great small business, check them out. There's Feederbrook Farm down um, mid-Atlantic. And those are three specifically that I have worked with before or starting to work with now where if you go to a farmer's market and you want to buy hand spun um, and it's somebody who feels confident enough to sell their hand spun, I mean, you could be talking up to, I've seen it for, and this is completely legit, I've seen it for up to like $80 a skein. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of love and work that goes into these and some people raise the sheep, do all the prep work, do the spinning. Um, you know, this is farm to table, this is farm to needles. So lastly, I will show you the last two, uh, as well as what's on the spinner now. So um, this was Friends in Fiber, and I got roll logs to try because I had not used them yet. And before I used my own blending board, I wanted to give it a, a try. 
So you can see here the consistency is even greater. Um, and that's what I was able to achieve by spinning from roll logs, which look like long, I don't know, that it's almost like a cigar shape, right? Or a branch or um, a pencil. It's not pencil roving, but you know, that, that idea where it's, it's a lot thinner. So you're not trying to pull and draft a big hunk of wool. You have something that's already light and airy. You can use it to spin more of a woolen spun yarn if that's what you wanna do. Um, or like just to have a more consistent yarn. And so what I did here is I mixed up, there was a, not quite a gradient, but it's some variety to greens and purples. So I would do greens that I then plied together. I would somewhat intentionally set it so a green and a purple would overlap and then just purple. So what I mean by that is I did this three ply. So if you can see here, and it's just hard to get it to the right point of color and focus. That was all greens, you know, somewhere in the middle I had the greens with the purples. And then I would try to have a section closer to the end. I don't think I had quite as much of purple on purple, but I, I do have some purple on purple at the end as well. With the idea that whenever I end up using this in, um, it will sort of do that progression and have that look to it. And then to finish up with what I had left, I did the same thing, but with a two ply. Okay, so that is a two ply. And what I have on now is a blend that is um, alpaca silk and maybe wool, alpaca silk and merino, I'll have to look. Um, but you can see how it glows, see that glow to it? That's the silk. And this is from Dorchester Farms, which again was at Wayland. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, today. I will tell you if you go down the route of getting one of these little e-spinners and you see these colored stacks, this is what we're going to be bringing over to Nancy at Black Sheep to, to make sure she has the right tools to start because we, we bought a whole pack of them this time. Um, you want to get something. These are light, light machines. So when you're spinning, they can move. So you want to get something to hold it and grip it. And then there are a lot of other tips. If you go the uh, electric eel wheel route, and you have Facebook, join the Facebook group. People there are so supportive. They will give you an answer in 30 seconds most of the time if there is one. Uh, Maurice has been great to get getting back to people when they have either a problem or they need a fix. We're talking uh, scrappy here, right? But there are fixes to almost everything and there have been multiple models that have come out and sometimes when a new model comes out, there might be a hiccup. But it does seem to be, in my experience so far, uh, a company and a community where you can get answers, you can get help, and I wouldn't worry if something goes wrong that it won't be made right. Uh, it does seem, you know, you can, and even new parts, if you blow a motor on these, you're talking like $14 to get a new motor and put it in there. So that's it for today. I hope that was a nice introduction for anyone who is a knitter or a crocheter who's interested in spinning and kind of says, what do I do? How do I do it? What do I think about? Where can I go? Um, I've been doing it for about a year. I don't do it all the time. I did a fair amount this week because we had kind of a heavy week in our house and um, I didn't feel a whole lot like knitting, but I did spin and it gave me something I could do to be very meditative and therapeutic and feel fiber and um, it was just what I needed. So knit kind, live kind. Thanks for being here. And I hope you enjoyed this.